So it's my great pleasure today to welcome um, a distinguished professor, Emeritus Jim Sellers from University of California, San Diego uh, School of Public Health and professorial fellow at ACU in Melbourne. Jim and Professor Mike Pratt um, some months ago wrote an op-ed which um, has been published in several blogs and uh, has recently been also um, published in a journal um, around, around a call to action for the role of physical activity in response to COVID-19 lockdowns globally. Um, and here today to um, also join us and respond to, to Jim's presentation, Jim's going to tell us about that, that piece, um, um, is adjunct professor uh, Trevor Shilton, um, Curtin University and, and University of Western Australia, as well as uh, the National Director um, of Physical Activity at the Heart Foundation uh, and Director of um, our newly founded Society, Australasian Society for Physical Activity. Um, and uh, Trevor is also one of our uh, executive committee members and he's going to give a policy response. So welcome to you both, Jim and Trevor, and thanks for joining us today on this really interesting topic, which is um, obviously continuing um, globally. So Jim, I think you've got some slides you're going to share and uh, I'll leave you to share your screen. All right, thank you, Joe, and very happy to uh, share our information with people across Australasia. And uh, so I'm going to uh, um, talk about physical activity in COVID-19, which is of worldwide relevance. And um, uh, since we are uh, organized this through Melbourne, I'm showing this picture from, uh, from Melbourne. Uh, during a, a very strict lockdown. Uh, we didn't have anything so strict uh, here in the United States, but I, I thought that was uh, uh, very notable uh, public uh, communication campaign. All right, so uh, I'm gr uh, greetings from San Diego. So we're still in the midst of our uh, pandemic here. There's plenty of infections and hundreds of infections just in our county every day. So I am, I am wearing mask uh, when I go out. So uh, here's the outline. The main, uh, the main message of this is that physical activity is a powerful health enhancer that may help with the coronavirus pandemic in several ways. Um, I'm going to also uh, talk just very briefly about um, physical activity and COVID-19 research priorities uh, that comes from another paper that we, we published and, and then we'll have a, a little discussion after that. Um, so um, when I came back from my last trip in March, um, uh, we, uh, my neighborhood uh, looked something like this on the left. I, I live near the beach. This boardwalk, I do a lot of walking and biking and uh, that sort of thing there. And it's, a, it's constantly on the move. It's a great place for physical activity. But uh, uh, a week or so after I came back, it looked like the picture on the right uh, to help control the spread of the virus. Um, the beach was closed. The boardwalk was closed. Trails were closed. Schools were closed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so... Uh, a lot of uh, people uh, uh, noticed immediately, well, now where are we going to be active? So um, physical activity uh, cl uh, was clearly affected by um, the pandemic, um, and that was clear to everyone. What was not so clear is what's the um, impact or potential impact of physical activity on the uh, pandemic. And that's what uh, I'm gonna focus on here. So as uh, Joe mentioned, we, um, Mike Pratt and I, uh, uh, who's, uh, he's now at uh, UC San Diego, uh, as I am, um, uh, we decided that the, the potential benefits of physical activity for the pandemic were uh, certainly not being talked about. Um, in public that we had seen. And it may be different in other parts of the world, but in the United States, nobody was talking about it. 
Um, and, uh, and we felt like even in the physical activity field, uh, some of these benefits were not well known. So um, uh, I, uh, I wanted to um, uh, be part of, as I called it, raising the alarm or ringing the bell that these, uh, we had an opportunity to use physical activity um, to make improvements in the pandemic but those opportunities were not being taken advantage of. So we said, well, let's get the word out as quickly as possible. So we wrote an op-ed. Um, uh, we could not interest any major newspaper uh, to publish it. Um, so we uh, sent uh, a version of it around to about 100 uh, people in the public health and physical activity world um, internationally, but mostly in the US. Um, and there was uh, uh, some interest in that. And, and so that um, supposed op-ed turned up as a blog several places, uh, but we wanted to make it a little more uh, uh, formal and maybe more credible. So we uh, put it together as uh, a bit of a review paper or editorial uh, for a journal. And we published it in the, the Brazilian Journal of Physical Activity and Health as part of a, a COVID-19 uh, special issue. And where this started for me is uh, in middle of February, I did a talk at a conference in um, India on, the conference was on immunity, inflammation, and cancer. And I talked about all of those three in relation to physical activity. And so I, as a psychologist, I didn't know much about in, in any of those. So I had to uh, review the literature and look into it. And then it occurred to me, everything I just learned about in, in, uh, physical activity, immune function, and inflammation were directly relevant to um, the, the, the viral pandemic. So that's what started it all off for me. So um, we identified six ways that uh, uh, that physical activity uh, can help in in the pandemic. So I'm going to briefly go through these. And in the in the paper, uh, we have review papers and we cite review papers and other evidence uh, for each of these. So uh, moderate intensity physical activity enhances immune function in several ways. Um, and reduces inflammation. So it could reduce the severity of infections because when the, in, the virus um, invades the body, uh, at some point it is um, detected by the immune system and attacked. And those, uh, that attack of the immune system uh, produces inflammation, which sometimes gets out of control. Um, so. Um, having that effect on immunity and inflammation is, uh, is just completely relevant to the infection. So, um, and there's, there's quite a literature showing that extended vigorous physical activity like marathons seem to reduce immune function uh, temporarily. So that means that walking uh, as uh, the most common moderate intensity activity is uh, an ideal and accessible activity for most people. And from our point of view, uh, physical activity should be proactively promoted during the pandemic, if only for this reason, but it is not. Second benefit, moderate activity can improve the chronic common uh, common chronic conditions that increase risk for severe COVID-19. About 95% of all of COVID-19 deaths, at least in the U.S. and probably in other, other uh, countries, are in people with chronic diseases such as obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. And of course, there's voluminous evidence about the benefits of physical activity in both preventing and treating uh, all of these. Uh, and, and of course, uh, most of the deaths are in uh, older people, um, but uh, these conditions uh, dramatically increase the risk of uh, severe COVID-19 and death um, uh, uh, in older people as well. 
Third benefit, moderate physical activity is one of the best stress management methods. It is uh, painfully obvious that um, during the, at least the, um, the height of the, uh, of the pandemic, um, there's a lot of stress from loss of jobs, loss of income, uh, uh, having to deal with uh, children being out of school, um, concerns about uh, getting sick, um, and the social isolation uh, during shutdowns. So um, moderate physical activity is um, good at both preventing and treating anxiety and depression, which are uh, probably the most common um, uh, symptoms of stress. Okay, fourth uh, benefit related to the third, stress and distress cause imbalances in cortisol, in the hormone cortisol, and that negatively affects immune function and inflammation. Um, and moderate physical activity helps bring cortisol into balance. Um, through through managing stress. So this is uh, another way that physical activity can help with immune function and inflammation. Fifth benefit, moderate activity produces antioxidants that reduce the severity of acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a serious complication of COVID-19. So that means that moderate physical activity has specific benefits specific to the lungs, which are the, the organ most affected uh, by the infection. And the final uh, benefit that we identified uh, could be the most uh, significant. Um, both acute and chronic physical activity improve immune responses to vaccines. And this is especially important in older adults because as we age, our immune systems become less effective. Um, and that's called immunosenescence. So, so that means that our uh, immune systems get sleepy. But physical activity can help reverse that, can overcome that. Uh, that natural response. So uh, I like to quote this one study that's among several, um, that older adults assigned to aerobic exercise were 30% to 100% more likely than a flexibility control group to attain sufficient antibodies from flu vaccines. Not that they're not just that their antibodies improved a little bit, but they met a threshold for um, uh, uh, keeping people uh, from getting the flu after taking the vaccine. So, and, uh, so physical activity helped the vaccine be effective. And again, this seems to me to be urgently needed information that should be acted on, but I have not seen any evidence that vaccine trials uh, for COVID-19 are um, testing physical activity as what would be called an adjuvant or a supplement to a vaccine. So uh, I remain, so we've tried to get this information out. Um, we actually wrote another, um, a second op-ed specifically focusing on the, the vaccine response. We couldn't get that published either. We sent it out again to 100 uh, or more people um, in public health and physical activity. I've seen no action uh, taken on, uh, on the basis of, that, of this information, except that um, our second blog was, uh, second op-ed was also posted as a blog. But that is not the kind of action um, that we really need. So uh, let, me, let me just show you, let me, okay, I'll show you this, uh, uh, that study that I just talked about for the, uh, for the vaccine. And so you can see with three influenza vaccines that um, there was um, uh, improved uh, percent of people with uh, sufficient antibody response um, uh, uh, that were in the, uh, the cardio or the moderate physical activity uh, 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 condition.
So uh, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty dramatic. Um, and I want to make one more point. One of the one of the things that I learned through my uh, my biological physiological research is that um, many of the the benefits of physical activity are are happen uh, acutely. So every time you're active, you're you're uh, and you uh, I circled. The, the panel at the bottom, showing that every time you're active, there's an acute boost in immune function, in uh, uh, anti-inflammatory agents, in um, antioxidants, in uh, cortisol control. Um, and these are all uh, created because of, of active muscles. Um, and so... Um, uh, that I, I think is very important, and we see this in psychological benefits of physical activity too. There are both acute effects every time that you're active of improved mood, and chronic um, uh, improvements over time as well. So uh, that, to me, is uh, some evidence that argues for uh, doing some moderate physical activity every day. Um, and, and and I might say, especially during during this pandemic. So we are still waiting and hoping um, that somebody uh, um, of influence um, uh, or many somebodies uh, in many countries uh, will take this information and say, well, it should be the responsibility of public health to inform people that there's something that they can do uh, to improve their chances of having that even if they get infected, that they will have uh, a, uh, uh, a a light case of, of the infection. But we have not seen that kind of action taken. So I'm going to, uh, and, and one of our hypotheses was, well, maybe um, uh, public health uh, leaders around the world um, say, well, the, the, the data that are in here are not specific to COVID-19. So they're, they're, it's really indirect evidence. So uh, in response to that concern, um, with uh, colleagues from around the world um, uh, representing different, uh, a variety of uh, cultures and backgrounds and uh, professional experience, we developed a physical activity and public health research agenda to inform coronavirus uh, uh, disease uh, policies and practices. Um, and so the, the general idea, we encourage investigators worldwide to conduct studies during the pandemic to provide evidence that supports greater emphasis on promoting physical activity during and after the pandemic. So I, I just want to give you a, a, a taste of some of the, um, we, we just uh, narrowed it down to seven priorities, uh, but let me uh, just uh, highlight a couple of them. So this one, examine the potential of physical activity as a mitigation strategy for, uh, for the moderating the impact of the, of the virus. So uh, what we recommend as part of COVID-19 testing for both clinical and surveillance purposes, administer a brief lifestyle survey that includes questions about physical activity um, as well as sedentary behaviors prior to the onset of any current illness. And the idea is, uh, and the hypothesis is, we believe uh, this is part of the rationale, that those who engage in regular uh, physical activity prior to infection may have less severe infections compared to those who, who uh, uh, do not do the activity. Here's, a, here's another one. Uh, we need to learn how to reduce disparities during physical in physical activity opportunities during crises. So the, the idea here is to conduct mixed methods, meaning quantitative and qualitative longitudinal studies to identify barriers and opportunities for maintaining physical activity among people at high risk um, for infection or for developing a severe case of COVID-19 due to uh, uh, pre-existing chronic conditions or being significantly economically impacted by the pandemic, such as losing their jobs. And so the idea here is this is kind of formative research um, to understand how we can uh, 
uh, help people from uh, dis in disadvantaged groups um, to be able to continue their physical activity in a safe way uh, during the pandemic. Let me just show you one more. Um, and this is evaluating methods for managing safe use of physical activity locations. And so the idea here is to conduct population surveys before and after indoor and outdoor physical activity facilities are closed to determine the impact on people's physical activity. Alternately, uh, retrospective studies could be done in places where uh, baseline assessment is not possible. But across the world now, um, uh, uh, play, uh, places that close down their um, gyms and trails and um, uh, the outdoor places for physical activity um, and then open them back up are now closing them back down again. So, uh, um, and as we note, as many have, this is a, a massive natural experiment. Um, that we as physical activity researchers need to be involved in evaluating. Um, so, um, and uh, uh, after the paper was published, I, I added one more, and it's to basically um, do a study, um, do studies um, uh, as part of vaccine trials to see if physical activity improves the uh, response to the vaccines. Um, so the, the last thing I'd like to say about this is that um, we developed, uh, we're trying to develop a, a network, the International Network of Coronavirus and Physical Activity Research, uh, INCOPAR, um, so that people with interest in and uh, doing this kind of research can get in touch with each other. And so um, we, we developed an online registry uh, with a link that's in the last paragraph of the paper, and you can see it here. So you can go to that link and you can see the, the studies that people have either started or are uh, considering. And if you're interested in similar studies, you can get in touch with those people. And the last time I looked, there were 17 study ideas or ongoing studies that were registered. Um, and so we encourage collaboration with others and uh, using common methods wherever possible. Okay, so um, I wanna just say hang in there, everybody who's still dealing with this. And uh, just to end on a positive note, these are some drawings on sidewalks around my neighborhood. And you can see the top one, a child is, is drawing these beautiful nature scenes to, uh, to um, improve the mood of people who are um, uh, being active, but uh, still uh, being affected by the coronavirus. And, and then here's a nice uh, message of uh, be happy, be kind, smile, and be thankful. So, uh, so uh, people are um, trying to help each other during this uh, very difficult time globally. So, Joe, I'm going to turn it back over to you so we can um, move ahead with the program. <clears throat> Thanks, Jim. That was fantastic. And, uh, and uh, I love some of those, those figures. A bit like yourself, um, I'm really not that familiar with some of that research around the inflammation and, and also the responses to vaccines, which is fascinating. But I particularly like that reminder of that need for regularity and that every dose of physical activity you get is, is benefiting you. And oh, gosh, that's such a good reminder. I feel like I need to go out for a run now. Um, thank you yeah. again. Well, one, one, comment, one comment on that yeah. about, well, yeah, I, I didn't really know about that. In the, in the, uh, in the U.S., we've uh, uh, developed two sets of physical activity guidelines in 20. 2008 and 2018. Mm -hmm. And both of those were accompanied by massive uh, literature reviews. And in and uh, like 800 pages each of literature reviews. And in neither of those were anything about infectious diseases covered. Mm -hmm. So this is evidence that is really not known even by the physical activity field. We tend to focus on chronic disease. <laughs> as, as we should yeah but 
There's more, even more. <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> Steak knives. <laughs> well, with that, I'm going to pass over to Trevor um, for his policy response. Thanks, Joan, and thanks, Jim. That, that's a fascinating presentation. And, uh, I mean, the way, the way that you just uh, both summed it up at the end there, I mean, there is a really critical juncture here between the positive role of physical activity in an acute sense, you know, whether that's around immune function or inflammation or infection, and how that relates to chronic conditions and, if you like, the longer-term and chronic dimension of this. And we're seeing uh, very, very clearly in our disease burden and uh, impacts of COVID-19 that it is older people who suffer complex chronic conditions who are um, suffering the burden the most. Now I'm going to unhook my phone. My apologies for that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think uh, just in response to that, I mean, there, there's a few things that we could say to respond, but what, one of them is that this uh, is yet more evidence of the critical importance of physical inactivity, physical activity as a public health and a broader societal priority. Um, so we, uh, my apologies for, for the phone. Um, so I... Uh, the first, the first thing I'd say about that is that, um, you know, building back better post-COVID-19, uh, physical activity has to be a critical part of that. Uh, first and foremost, we need funded national physical activity strategies, and uh, we're different, differently placed around the, the world in that regard. Uh, my country, Australia, doesn't have one. And uh, second, related to that, we have very solid evidence of what we can do about this. Uh, in relation to what would be the central components of such a strategy. And uh, this experience of COVID-19 might add a new dimension to that as well. We know if you, if you look at the Global Action Plan on physical activity, if you look at documents like ISPAR's uh, Eight Best Investments for Physical Activity, uh, if you look at the Heart Foundation in Australia's Blueprint for an Active Australia, they all say the same things, that we need to invest in settings like schools and workplaces and healthcare settings, in transport and built environments, media campaigns, and priority populations, um, uh, seniors, children, disadvantaged groups. So this is a strong impetus for more of that, for more focus on advocacy to have robust physical activity strategies in all countries around the world. And if I may just zero in on one thing, uh, one policy dimension, and it's the dimension around, um, in light of the, uh, uh, experience of late of our built environments and our local neighbourhoods. Um, we've seen increases in walking and cycling in neighbourhoods around the world. Uh, we've seen uh, investment uh, as a result, whether it's stimulus funding or whether it's pop-up cycle lanes or pop-up um, public open spaces for people to interact and people to be active. Uh, and of course, the lockdowns around the world, as Jim said, have really shone a light on that. And they've really shone a light on our local communities. In, in the Melbourne experience, um, people were not allowed to move outside of a, a five kilometre radius. And, um, and uh, that's, um, that's, uh, there's nothing more powerful than that to shine a light on um, your neighbourhood. Um, and um, in Melbourne, we, uh, there was a report in the ABC that uh, 340,000 Melbournians don't have access to quality public open space within five kilometres. So this kind of experience of living locally, really everything from access to fresh foods and fruit and vegetables to walking and cycling infrastructure to public open space, uh, it uh, really does shine a light on um, your local environment. Um, we and, and finally, just in relation to that, where there is evidence around the world, I touched on this earlier, that people are walking more, cycling more, uh, that living locally has heightened awareness on what's in your local neighbourhood, perhaps heightened community demand for uh, more supportive local neighbourhoods and in interest among our architectural and urban planning and transport planning colleagues. Uh, there's been increased demand for active space, you know, whether that's public open space or, or nature or just having more space, commanding uh, some greater road space, for example, for walking and cycling. So I think all of these um, public policy dimensions of this 
uh, while recognising that we're all very differently placed around the world in terms of where we're at, whether we're in the rapid response or the uh, managing the crisis or when building back better mode around the world, we're all in different stages of this. Uh, physical activity, uh, physical activity policy and built environment policy all have a key role to play. And part of that is public education and advocacy around the kind of concepts that we heard from Jim uh, before. Thanks so much, Trevor. And, and I, I, I'm also thinking um, as you were speaking about some of the changes we've seen in cycling and, and, and other types of physical activity um, that there probably has been though differences in different subgroups of the population. And I know um, that, you know, there might've been perhaps not such great benefits for children, um, particularly children who are doing schooling at home where they're being attached to a screen, not having their recess, lunch breaks, playing with their friends. Um, I do, I am concerned about, about, you know, the impact, negative impact on children's physical activity, not being able to engage in their community sport, um, I think there's quite a bit in terms of recovery to do. Um, yeah, so I think that there's, it, there's, there's going to be perhaps different impacts on, on different pockets of the population. Yes, well, I think um, that is equally applicable to seniors, to uh, mm. disadvantaged groups. Um, was, I was reading just yesterday a, a focus on housing and homelessness. It's really, it's really shone a light on, on, on that as well. Um, and even uh, I touched on this very briefly, but even the way that we are now living our lives and, and how much of this uh, uh, will be uh, in our next version of the new normal. Uh, mm. I know that working at home for many is going to be part of that. So what are the public policy implications of that? You know, that also shines a light on local neighbourhoods. It's contributing to reduce traffic congestion, perhaps less need to invest in traffic and transport infrastructure and invest more in local infrastructure and local communities, which we know increases walking. So some of that might be good. Um, so uh, I think we, in this amazing natural experiment that we're all living through, uh, as we get to the build back better phase of it, uh, I think it's really important for us as researchers and as um, advocates to uh, think about what contribution we can make to advocating for a, a better society and to build back better post COVID in a way that makes it easier for people to be more active. Jim, do you have a response? Uh, yeah, a couple of uh, a couple of thoughts. And um, um, one of one of the first things that uh, Trevor mentioned was um, it uh, this pandemic is showing uh, um, uh, in a different way how controlling uh, chronic diseases is very important. I tend to say that a little bit more provocatively, that this, uh, this infectious disease pandemic has revealed the depth of our failure to control chronic diseases. Because mm. like I said, 95% of the deaths are in people with chronic diseases. Yeah. So if there was less chronic disease, um, I would expect fewer deaths and less uh, uh, severe infections. And we know that one of the best ways to control all of those chronic diseases is get people active. But how hard are we working to do that? Around the world, I think the, 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 the typical answer is uh, not very hard and obviously we're not working well enough for that. Um, I'd also like to, if you uh, will uh, amuse me, uh, or uh, uh, ex excuse me a little mm -hmm. bit, want to take off on some of the built environment um, uh, comments um, because um, yes, we want to build back better. And I think we, we have a good rationale for doing that, but I have heard some opposite uh, comments and recommendations. I was distressed uh, a few months ago when I read in the Los Angeles Times um, a prominent op-ed that said sprawl in Los Angeles has saved lives during the pandemic because um, they said, well, look how much worse New York is doing uh, than Los Angeles. And during the time, New York was having the worst outbreak probably in the world. 
Um, um, and I, I had to respond to that. I wrote a letter to the editor and I said, uh, your logic is extremely flawed. Um, and it's, it's not the density that is the problem. It's the crowding. Um, and we see crowding in uh, ag rural uh, places where agricultural workers are living in crowded living conditions. We see crowding in rural areas where people are uh, crowded in meatpacking plants uh, where there have been a lot of outbreaks. And I pointed out that the density of San Francisco uh, is like three or four times higher than that of Los Angeles, but the infection and death rates were uh, three to four times lower than in Los Angeles. So if, if um, I, I want to, so that led uh, a colleague and I, uh, uh oh, let's see, I have to, uh, uh, it led a, a colleague and I to write a commentary that uh, I would like to highlight here. And if I can, I'll just do this. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so here it is. So uh, uh, Deepti Adlaka is the, the, the primary author on this, and, and she uh, um, uh, has degrees in planning, architecture, and public health. This was in the journal Cities and Health, and uh, she's based in uh, Northern Ireland. And so the idea here is that activity-friendly neighborhoods can benefit non-communicable and infectious diseases. So one of the things we wanted to do is to put this um, misguided recommendation about density to the test. Um, so this is a scatter plot of uh, 36 cities um, with their population density uh, on the, the horizontal axis and COVID-19 deaths on the vertical axis. And the line is, the, is the, basically the regression line. And you can see that actually it's basically zero, but it's a little bit negative. So um, uh, the cities with the, the highest um, uh, death rates, um, when this was done in June, um, were really in the, in the, the low to middle uh, density spectrum when you considered the whole world. So, um, and this, uh, there was a, a much bigger study in the U.S., much more um, uh, 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 more controls and more cities and that sort of thing. And they came up with the same conclusions. The other thing I want to show is the summary of our um, conclusions from our commentary. So here are the environmental attributes, most of which we, we focus on and we recommend for promoting physical activity. Uh, except automobile optimized transportation system. We have evidence that that is not good for physical activity or chronic diseases. And then we have the expected effects, uh, net effect on chronic diseases or non-communicable diseases in the middle column. And they're all, they're all positive except for uh, automobile optimized transportation system. And then we looked at um, the uh, evidence we could find and um, and uh, let's say logic at, on the expected net effect on infectious diseases, which is what ID stands for. So we actually showed evidence that residential density has is not a, it has a zero um, uh, 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 association. Mixed land use is positive um, because um, you can walk and bike um, to places that you need to go. Um, so that's a low risk way of of getting there. Um, driving probably is affected is is um, reduces the risk of infection uh, because you're alone in your car. And I have heard uh, automobile executives make that point. You can control your environment in a car, so it's safe. Um, so so that that's probably true during a pandemic. Um, and public transportation, well, there there is risk there. Um, it can be mitigated to some extent, but uh, we consider that um, a risk for infection. Pedestrian and bicycling facilities, um, uh, 
space, uh, you can be active and you can um, be uh, well distanced. Same with parks, trails, and open space, and same with open streets programs. So the types of things that um, uh, that uh, Trevor mentioned. And so here's here's one way to look at that. Um, so uh, our recommendation is urban design recommendations need to be made considering effects on both um, infectious and non-communicable diseases. And NCDs account for about 65% of global deaths every year. So, um, and so pandemics are catastrophic but rare events. The last major infectious disease Pandemic cost 50 million lives, but it was 100 years ago. Um, so um, uh, it was estimated uh, at, in a commentary on one of our papers that if everybody on the planet lived in an actively friendly neighborhood, about 2 million deaths per year could be avoided. Um, so um, we really need to consider uh, uh, not jump to uh, hasty conclusions on the basis of faulty logic or limited data um, related to this pandemic. So I, I just wanted to show that. And again, this this commentary is in a journal called Cities and Health. That's great. Thanks, Jim. Trevor, any last words before we wrap up? No, I, I, I would just, I guess, reinforce what I said before as we focus around the world on building back better in the next phase and what does life after COVID look like, um, just to try and uh, zero in on some of those positives as advocates touch points. What does living locally look like? How can we capture this uh, increase in walking, walking and cycling and sustain that in the longer term? Um, what about technology and working from home and what are the advantages of that in relation to walkability and um, the, uh, the importance of uh, devoting more space and whether that's devoting road space to walking and cycling. Uh, um, it just takes up an inordinate amount of the uh, real estate in our cities or whether it's uh, nature and public urban space. I think, I think we need a... Um, a healthy urban planning, transportation advocacy strategy around post-COVID. And um, it's, it's been good that we've been able to touch on that. And uh, in Jim's last comments there, have the arguments to counter uh, what people might throw back at us, which um, mm -hmm. is inaccurate. Great. And Jim, last word from you. My last word is um, I would ask everyone who watches this to um, be, be an advocate, become an advocate in your country, educate people about the benefits of physical activity um, that they're not aware of. Uh, that education could be quite effective and try to find people who can, um, uh, public health leaders who can proactively promote physical activity specifically to help con uh, help um, mitigate the impact of the of the pandemic so um, please speak up in your country and be a leader thanks very much and the exciting thing about um, ASPA is that we are very much a network of not just researchers but also um, policy makers and practitioners and and so I think um, we're well placed to do that and um, we call on our membership to um, to help you do exactly what you're saying and and uh, we just don't want to be continuing or slide back to normal or even worse than what normal was so um, yeah really fantastic um, presentation loved it and uh, as always outstanding science and interpretation and synthesis of the evidence so thanks Jim and thanks Trevor to you for your fantastic policy response thanks Joe yeah, thank you Joe thanks Jim <laughs>